And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from Cathawk Studios, creators of the upcoming Alliance of the Sacred Sons. The one and only Steve. How are you doing tonight, man? I'm doing great. Thank you for inviting me to your temple. I'm I'm pleased to be here. Thank thank you for thank you for coming on. I would say in braving the hell of time zones, but we're in the same time zone, so that so that's out. Well, it works out really well. Although I would have come on no matter what time zone, yep. even at three a.m., I still still come on. Mm -hmm. Um. So. I like to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Taking that into, taking that into account, f the first thing I'm curious about, since this is a since this is a genre of games that is not that is not exactly one that you stumble into. How did you how did you first get into 4X and grand and um, grand strategy games? And talk to me about the. Or about where, about where you got the early ideas to do um, Alliance. Sure. Well, I have played 4X games. I, I'm 40, I'm almost 45 years old, so I'm I have definitely been playing games since the 80s. Um, my first real 4X was the original Civilization, <coughs> Sid Meier's Civilization. So I've just always kind of been fascinated by these kind of games, um, you know, because there's not that instant gratification. Um, you know, you just you build up towards something. And when you win a game like a civilization or a master of Orion or, or a game like that, you really feel like you did something significant because those games can go for weeks. So I just kind of stuck with the genre. I played all through high school, um, played pretty much every mainstream four X and even some more obscure ones you can think of. And a lot of grand strategy games, paradox is about probably thousands of dollars in my business over my lifetime. So <laughs> Um, you know, I just really like the genre. You know, I just feel like it's it's one of those genres where it, you really get a lot of value for the money. You know, people talk about uh, our you know dollars per hour or cents per hour played. I mean, it, it's mm -hmm. just uh, you just get a lot out of it. Also, like war games and things like that. So I've always been in a kind of really detailed strategy type games, either board games or computer games. So yeah. you know, but over the years, I started thinking about making a 4x on my own i've always kind of dabbled in programming i don't have a degree in it or anything but i've always i was i, I was uh did a lot of it in high school i actually competed in uh programming contests and programming teams and it's something i always kind of had an interest in so i kind of dabbled in programming throughout college and you know kind of going on to my career and i don't know five or six years ago i started really thinking about you know what makes a good strategy game or, or in, in really even a 4x game because this was the time where 4x's were kind of i don't know six or seven years ago, there was a real dearth of good ones. Mm. Um, there just wasn't anything new coming out. No one was really making them anymore, at least not the, the AAA studios. And, you know, a lot of people were talking about the genre is kind of in danger, you know, because people were moving on to mobile games and, and just kind of simpler games. So I started thinking about, well, what to me makes a great 4X game? And, and I always kept coming back to the idea of, you know, as you as the emperor, you know, in pretty much every 4X game you ever play, you're kind of this gray omniscience that kind of can do everything, see everything, know everything. You know, you're, you know, you're supposed to be this, this, this ruling deity, but yet you're sitting here building starships and creating battle plans and researching things and, and organizing fleets and colonizing planets and deciding, you know, what if miners or farmers or engineers are, 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 are going to be part of your, your building cues. And just, it, to me, it just seemed kind of silly. Mm -hmm. that if we're playing a game from that grand a perspective, you know, no emperor would be dabbling in that. So I kind of set out to create the idea of a 4X where you truly are an emperor. You truly are a person. You have stats. You have a lifespan. You can die. You know, you can only do so many things per turn. Um, you have to, you know, the things you do can piss off other people in your empire. And it just kind of gradually formed in my mind um, kind of wrote down some ideas and I just started working on a project to kind of teach myself large scale programming. And the first version was called Imperia and it was a free uh, game. I just, I just downloaded on SourceForge 
it really was just for me at the beginning. I just wanted to learn to program. And <laughs> why not do it with a grand strategy 4X game like everybody else, right? So, uh, you know, that was kind of my, my hobby project. And, you know, I uh, posted about it in a few forums and, and some people played it and downloaded it. And like, hey, this, this is pretty cool. You know, you should do something with it. And I was kind of like, yeah, right. Um, but enough people said, no, no, this is this is a thing. You should, you should take it further. Um, finally decided to take it further. And so I kind of looked at my options. I decided to um, kind of start over from scratch, essentially, because I had done the original Imperial was in Visual Basic uh, using XNA, which is almost no one uses anymore. It's basically DirectX. And uh, so I decided to move to Unity and C Sharp. Um, so it'd be a lot more stable base. And I just basically scrapped the entire project and started over. And that was about four years ago. And I'd worked on it for a long time. Um, you know, just kind of part time, you know, I had a full time job management. And, and uh, so it was just very, very, very part time. And gradually, the, the idea just kind of grew. You know, we had the idea of great houses, because we felt like in the far future, that they, I felt like that would be something that, um, you know, that maybe a future empire would have kind of like Dune, or uh, Emperor of the Fading Suns, which a lot of people compare us to We're really not that much like, like Emperor of the Fading Sun, which is an amazing game, by the way. So I don't know. It's it just kind of grew game, from there. But it's, but it's jank as all hell. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if if someone made that, that game was ahead of its time. I think if if that game was made nowadays uh, by a really you know triple A studio, I think it would have a lot of potential because it kind of I don't know if you, I'm sure you heard a game called Shadow Empire. Yes. You know, it, it kind of Shadow Empire is a really cool game. You know, it does a lot of things very well and kind of that that space combat you know, on the planet and the idea that you're kind of moving from planet to planet and kind of almost like a 4X on an, in each individual planet, you know, the scope is really huge. I think, you know, Pax Nova also is another game that's not exactly the same thing, but kind of that scope. So it, it, it's definitely, definitely a cool scope, but we're not, that's not really our perspective. So, um, but the idea of great houses has always appealed to me. The idea that you have an empire that, you know, yes, you're you're not in an empire, but you have these houses that are kind of at each other's throats and are always kind of looking for weakness. And if you make the wrong move or piss them off too much, then they'll, you know, may move against you. Um, so the idea that you came in kind of as an 18 year old brand new emperor, um, you're kind of you're, you're legitimate, but you're shaky. It just really seemed interesting to me as kind of a starting point. And it's nothing that no other real 4X has ever done. Um, I know there's now a few kind of uh, political simulators uh, I, I do think I kind of started a movement with the uh, um, the dynastic and political aspects of, of the genre. But, you know, at the end of the day, Alliance is about telling a story. It's it's a story of your empire, but it's also a story about you. You grow, you learn new skills, things happen to you through events. Um, and no, no two games, no two careers will ever be the same. And so that's kind of the experience that we want people to have. On the one end, yes, you're, you're controlling a vast empire, but on the other, you're a person. And you it's almost like an RPG in some aspects. So I think kind of summarizing it, you know, we wanted people to kind of feel like they're running an empire and feel like they're a person and that their their decisions have weight and that they're not omniscient, but that they're, you know, one person that doesn't necessarily control everything and kind of having that feeling of indirect control and, and still having this enormous ponderous thing that they're trying to move. I, I, I kind of liken it to the, to the, the foundation, you know, in the old galactic empire um, where, you know, it's basically become impossible to manage. Um, you know, you have an emperor, but they're basically a figurehead because there's just, there's no way that one person can, can move an entire, you know, uh, empire, you know, what, 20, 20 million wor worlds. So obviously our scope isn't nearly that large, but I still wanted to give people that feeling of, of really controlling an empire, you can't go in and, and multi micromanage it. You have to control it at a macro level and 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 really kind of throw your weight around and and the, you know the the empire reacts to you rather than you reacting to the empire. Mm -hmm. And given that you put up on the uh, Kickstarter page, no more micromanagement hell, I immediately thought, well, thank thank God I'm not going to have to deal with Aurora 4X flashbacks. Yeah, Which, yeah, no, I, and I love Aurora. You know, it's it's got its place, but I um, uh, I I def I highly respect the fact that 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 it's that that is a one man job, but um, at the same time, if you if you look at any space four X, there is a very and even even a whole even some non space four Xs, 
there is a very clear reason why they why they try and stay away from a lot of bright colors. <laughs> yeah. Like you use you you look you look at you look at distant worlds, you look you look at Master of Orion, you you look at um the Endless series. Very good by the way. And it's and you don't really have an excess of brightness. And even in something like Endless Legend, you're um you're not gonna get you're not gonna get that level of bright. You get maybe um earthen tomes at best. Because, yeah. Because you don't want anything that's going to kill your eyes. Yeah, it, it's hard. You know, we, we've done the UI. My U, UI artist is, is really good. Um, and we've kind of redone the UI maybe four or five times. If you've kind of seen some earlier screenshots, they're floating around out there. Um, you know, we, we've definitely experimented with colors. And, we, you know, it, it's very easy to go crazy with colors because you're trying to convey information in a, in a graphical way. And But you're right. It, it, I think most people go with the, A, because it's kind of the far future. It's kind of a grim future anyway, mm -hmm. but also because, like you said, it can really clash if you do it if you do it the wrong way or pick the wrong colors. Yeah. Now that said, I can understand why some people compare you to um, Empire of the Fading Suns. Um, not in not in terms of in, not in terms of anything specific that you have that um, that is in common with that game because there isn't. And I will admit that I'm more. F this is one of those situations where I'm more familiar with the TRPG Fading Suns than I am the uh, 4X game. But I'd say it's more. I'd say it's more a consequence of a similar aesthetic, you know, with the, with doing a space opera with no with noble houses and all that. Um. But there is. But whenever it comes to, whenever it comes to four X and grand strategy. First thing. First thing I need to ask because a lot of people um. Try and try and have a dividing line between a 4x game and a grand strategy game. So this is going to be two, this is going to be a twofold question. One, what what do you what would you aside from scale? What would you say is the difference between, as far as you define it, a 4x game and a grand strategy game? And two, where does Alliance fit into into that paradigm? Hmm. Well, those are really good questions. Um... I mean, I'll answer your second first. I, I think we fit squarely in the middle um, because we have the 4X elements. If you break it down, you know, expand, explore, exploit, exterminate, mm -hmm. we have all those elements in the game. Um, you expand, you, you create uh, colonies, uh, you scout planets, you actually scout whole constellations. That's kind of how you expand. They're almost like continents on, a, on an earthen map. You know, you exploit, you can build outposts, you can build colonies, um, you, you can... Uh, you know, you can exterminate. You have what are called challenges, which is kind of like declaring war on other houses to gain their territory or power. Um, and you know, so you have all the four X's. And you know, when I look, when I think about grand strategy, I think about again, what role do I play? You know, if you think about war games, you know, you can play attack like like advanced squad leader. You know, that's not grand strategy. You're playing as a squad. You're playing individual men. You're playing leaders. Um, but you're playing on, on a kind of a small scale. So I would, I would call that a tactical, you know, tactical strategy. Whereas if you're playing, you know, the Battle of Barbarossa or you're playing, you know, Hearts of Iron mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, uh, any other, you know, kind of large scale World War II game where you control not only, you know, the movement of armies, but you might control the economy, you might control research, you know, you control kind of the overall strategy of individual countries or blocks. And so to me, now you're kind of getting out of the weeds. Now you're controlling, um, you're making those decisions that operate on a much greater scope and affect a maximum number of things in the game. So I guess I would classify grand strategy as games where your decisions resonate across the entire game um, over, 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 the, over a period of time. Whereas... A tactical is more, you know, decisions you make in the moment. Decision; those decisions may have later effects, but they don't necessarily resonate across everything you do for the rest of the game. And so, when I when I say is it more of a four X or a grand strategy, I really say both because you have the four X elements and you're also making those large scale decisions um, to that that kind of resonate. I think a lot of four X games actually are grand strategy. If it, you know, there's no one definition that I've heard for it other than kind of the 
scale. But to me, an empire or a galaxy is about as high a scale as you can get. So I think 4X games do themselves a disservice by not considering themselves that grand strategy. I, I think if 4X wasn't invented, you know, it was kind of a coin term when Master of Orion came out. It's kind of a marketing term. Uh, I think they would be considered grand strategy games in and of themselves. Yeah. And in all in all honesty, give with the with the whole um, the whole micromanagement that that you've mentioned, I um I of, I often wonder if that and maybe this is a thought that you've had as well that that sort of focus is a consequence of the fact that um four X the four X concept is is rooted in board gaming i mean after all um civilization was originally an avalon hill board game mm -hmm. um yeah um yeah i mean i think because you have this concept that you know most games nowadays obviously computers were very primitive back in the 70s and then in the 80s you know they were just starting to come on my first computer was an atari 800 xl mm -hmm. i mean other than like a commodore 64 which i had at school but you know, so you really couldn't do a lot of these complex board games that were there at the time. And, you know, if you look at war games from like the 70s and 80s, like Avalon Hill, uh, even, uh, you know, they were kind of the, the forebearers. But, I mean, the games are insanely complicated. I feel bad for anybody who played the campaign for North Africa. Oh, my goodness. I, actually, <laughs> I, I don't have the game, but I was I, I kept hearing about how complicated it was, like how you had to. I think you had to, you know, there was a pasta rule for the Italians. They use extra water for their pasta. I mean, and it really does. I actually downloaded the, you can download the manual and you can kind of look at all the player aids. I mean, I cannot fathom doing that and finding, you know, and they say up to 10 players and, you, you know, you have kind of an overall commander for each side and then each person takes like a logistical and air boss and land boss and whatever. And I don't know, I, I don't know two people that would play much less 10. But I've I mean, heard, back then, I've heard stories about that game starting fights. Uh, I'm sure. Well, I'm sure. Like, I, I, I can't imagine completing a game like that. I do have a game called War of the Pacific, um, which is like the biggest game. It's got almost 10,000 counters, um, and it covers the entire war. And I mean, every turn is like a week. And I mean, I, you know, I think I, I bought it just to say that I have it. I don't, I don't anticipate ever actually playing it with someone. Certainly not for the full campaign. But, I mean, you know, back then, those were the games that people would play because you didn't have the computers. And, you know, obviously people were a lot more social. And, you know, I think life was a little slower paced. And you had the time back then. You know, you could spend a weekend or go to a friend's house. And, you know, that people had their basements and gaming nooks and things like that. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a natural evolution of, of where board games have come. And now with the power of computers, you know, you can do more. And you can sort of expand upon these ideas that were, were started with a board game, you know, like civilization, you look at the original civilization. I mean, I, I guarantee Sid Meier, if he'd had a time machine or if you'd have shown him Civ six, well, I say Civ four, Civ six is a little simple, but Civ four and said, this is what civilization is going to evolve into. He would have been just blown away because, you know, computers have evolved to allow us to have these complex games and, and create these complex worlds and have these complex or relatively complex AIs. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, it allows the genre to, to be a lot better for it because um, it's just, it's a genre that really needs that atmosphere and it needs a very capable opponent. So yeah, yeah I, I, but you can still see the, the board game beginnings. And, and I think any, any game that I have an idea for, I always try to kind of do a board game version of like a, just a little test version to kind of see if pieces fit together because I, I think it's a great way to test out game concepts. Yeah. And, um, since you mentioned civilization, one of, and given the fact that this is a space 4x, one of the one of these stories that will always come to mind is the interesting set of circumstances that led to the creation of well the the game that the game that introduced me to 4x, um, Alpha Centauri. Oh, great game! With, That's yeah, played that a lot in college. Because um, the reason why Alpha Centauri got made, and I'm vastly simplifying the story was because due to a due to a um, legal pissing match that was going on at the time they couldn't make civilization 3 um it basically had to do with the with the complicated legal situation between fire axis and micro pros hmm. is that why we had call to power and all that stuff going on about that time it could have been i'd have to i'd have to check 
Interesting. But sorry, go on. The, just... But um, it was suggested. Why not? Ha why not have the? Why not have a sequel to Civilization that is a literal sequel? I.e., you know how one of one of the victory conditions is going into space. Well, their motion is. Okay, well, okay, well, let's have let's have it that the sequel literally sends co colonists into space and go from there. And that that was how um that was how Alpha Centauri came around. Now, obviously, ev eventually that would get settled and a Civilization Three would come out, but that wasn't known at the time. And they had to put they had to put something out so they so that they could keep everybody around, obviously. Hmm, but I didn't know. But give, given the fact that you, in the um, in the summary page on the Kickstarter, you've cited Crusader Kings Two, Distant Worlds, The Quiet Sleep, and Welcome the Boat Murdered, aka Dwarf Fortress. Yeah. And Canacoke, if you're familiar with the boat murdered story. Vaguely, I tried to watch a couple of the videos, but I didn't get all the way through. Um. Probably the worst one that anyone's ever seen of of a of a um, Dwarf Fortress game. But given the fact that Crusader Kings 2 was listed on this, this is where I have to go into the big fucking elephant in the room that's decided to crash on my couch. A big criticism with a lot of grand strategy games and a fair few 4X games has been how combat ha has, is resolved. Because a lot of times, and civil, and um, Crusader Kings and Europa Universalis are the big culprits of this, and the majority of Paradox's work over the last ten plus years is the fact that for all the moving parts, when it comes to when it comes to um, the stuff that happens before combat, the actual fight itself is a glorified dice roll. And I'm curious what I'm curious if you, when it comes to combat and conflict with Alliance of the Sacred Sons, if you guys have been trying to veer away from the from the whole dice roll problem that's that's plagued this genre for years. Well, it's a little more complex than a dice roll. Now you don't control forces directly. Forces are basically fleets. Mm -hmm. um, basically, it, it, it's a. It's, created a high level you as the emperor say you know hey war prime who's like your you know your your war manager uh i want to take this system or i want to take i want to conquer this planet or i want to um you know scout this well we're going to move that to another part of the the ui basically you as the emperor say i want to do something militarily and your war prime says okay um, let's do that. Or they may say, no, because that's my house that you're attacking and I'm not going to do that. Or you're not at war with them and that would be dishonorable. But anyway, so at a high level, you send your, your forces and each force is contains, and, and there are different kinds of forces. There are offensive forces, combat forces, scouting forces, um, terror forces, um, um, you know, planetary uh, invasion forces, etc. And so they have templates that require different types of ships. Mm -hmm. So... For example, a combat force might take a, you know, a scout corvette, a command destroyer, and two uh, combat light cruisers. That's just kind of an example. So you don't actually build every single ship, and you don't kit them out and design them. You basically, as the emperor, just make sure you have enough uh, shipyards that are making the right kinds of ships that when you create a template, these ships are available to, to create. So they're kitted out. They're sent into battle. And so, you know, forces, each ship basically fights against other ships. And so it's kind of like, um, I, would, I would say Shadow Empire is a good example where, you know, yes, two armies are being thrown against each other. But if you look at the details, there's an awful lot of detail going on where there's individual shots and there's, you know, is a retreats and, and, you know, misses and hits and certain amount of damage being taken. That's all happening under the hood of Alliance. Um, you just don't see it at that level. Um, actually, yes, it, it, the, the combat is is derived at a literally shot to shot level. Um, so there's not, it's not one big dice roll. It's a hundred small dice rolls mm -hmm. and, you know, smaller fleets can win if you have good technology or if you have the right uh, commander, because uh, efficiency is a big part of that. And if you have a terrible admiral, your efficiency will be low, meaning you won't do as much damage and your defense will be less and generally won't perform as well. So, 
you know, I'm, I'm quite proud of the model. You know, I played war games for about 25 or 30 years. So, um, you know, I like the idea of combat where it's not always the bigger force winning. Sometimes it's about the more efficient force or it's about having the right force, you know, for the, for the situation. So, um, I hope that answers your question, but yeah. but no, I, that kind of drives me nuts too because it looks like you have a lot of choice when you look at a game like Europa, and then you realize, well, you really don't. You have infantry, you have artillery, and you have horses, and that's basically it. And and <laughs> your your general doesn't really have as much effect as you think it does. So I totally get that. Yeah. Now, now this is this is admittedly a person a personal nitpick of mine, but once one um, strategy game series that I have been that I have had it. I'm a fan of, but have had a rocky relationship for the, for the last few years, is the Total War series. And if you're familiar with any Total War game in the in the last decade, you you might have an, a bit of an idea about where I'm going with this. And that is that is the fact that in that in those games, especially ever since they um, started using the Warscape engine, Diplo attempts for diplomacy can be a bit um, derpy. At best, at worst, it can be pants on head, retarded. Yeah. Or where you where you have ca you have cases of 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 um enemy factions declaring war on you for just sneezing in their direction, or allies declaring war on other on other allies that you have. <laughs> Or sim or similar bits of stupidity, and I'm curious how diplomacy is gonna, is going to be working in your in um, alliance, and if you guys are tr if you guys have been taking steps to avoid having those having um, alliance entanglements in that regard. Well, and and diplomacy is a lot different in alliance as opposed to a typical four X because your main empire so to speak are actually your internal houses and that's who you really um you have your diplomacy i mean your ultimate goal is to unite the empire you know in the final version you're actually fighting against an uh, ancient alien species that basically destroyed earth initially a thousand years ago and sent you out here and then they basically come back to finish the job so mm -hmm. you're trying to ally the empire either by subjugation or by vassalizing or you know those are the extreme examples, but one way or another, you've got to get cooperation from your other houses. So, you know, you're, you're, you know, one, one thing that's a major conceit of the game is that you don't have complete control. You know, in every other 4X, let's say you have a planet that you want to improve mining on. Well, pretty much every 4X game, you just click on the planet, you put, put some mines in the build queue and, you know, make sure you have enough materials to build them. And what, 20 turns later, boom, you got your mines. You might have to change over a few pops to, to miners or, you know, whatever, but that's, that's what you do. Well, in Alliance, you don't have full control over the planets. Um, if you don't own them, what are called holdings, if your house doesn't directly hold the planet, they're owned by another house. And you can't just go in and say, hey, you're going to, you know, you need to build this and this and this. Um, you can do projects, which are kind of large scale uh, things that improve planets, um, you know, and, and those can span, you know, systems or provinces. And those are kind of big, big, big things. But as far as the day-to-day -day operations, you really can't demand that they, they do that. You can talk to the Viceroy and say, hey, I'd like it if you could build more mines. Um, but if that's not in the house's best interest or you don't have a good relationship or they're not afraid of you, <laughs> um, they can just tell you to pound sand. So, you know, and, and a lot of that has to do with whether you have a good relationship with the house. As a, a good example, you know, you create your house and you have what are called traditions. And you have mining tradition, you know, farming tradition, military tradition, government tradition, economic tradition, etc. So you can, you know, you can't have everything. So you might be a house that's really good at military, but you have a terrible mining um, tradition, which is bad because you need minerals um, to build materials that build your warships uh, and keep your planets running. So there's a house called House Iloa that's fantastic at mining. And so if you have a good relationship with them, you can actually get their characters that are from their house to become your viceroys and they make your planets much better at mining and they do a better job at focusing the output and building mines, training up the miners, you know, each pop, which are kind of minor, they have different uh, um, jobs on a planet. It's kind of like Victoria too, where they have pops and they have skills and they, they get better. So, you know, having a good viceroy that's good at mining will, will help with that. So, you know, you, you can't, 
you you can't be friends with every house because houses have their own uh, internal politics. So I guess you know there is some of that you know the friend of my friend is my enemy kind of deal. But you can control. You know, you, you kind of have to pick and choose. Okay, I want these two houses. I need to get them on my side because I need mining, and this is the most powerful house, so I can't afford to piss them off. Or whatever. You know, every game is different. There may be a couple of really strong houses. They may all be weak, but they have skills that you need. You know, one thing that I really, you know, it's great, I think is great about Alliance is that, yes, you know, the game you start on Uterra, you know, Neosiris is your home system. But the, the entire rest of the of the galaxy and, and of your empire is pre-generated. So um, diplomacy is really important in the sense that you have to decide early on what houses you're going to be, make nice with, and then that affects the decisions you make. You know, if you you know we have what are the celestial council. These are what are called your primes. They're kind of like your in the U.S. we call them the cabinet. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have the secretary of war, secretary of defense, secretary of the you know interior, whatever, and these are prestigious positions and, and they give characters power and, and they, they like it when you give them, you, you have a good relationship and their house does too. But you have a, can have a situation where let's say you have an empty position and, you, and you've got, wow, I've got a great candidate. And then you can look at that candidate's most hated enemy. And you know, they, they have a house leader of a house that you're trying to um, keep good terms with. Well, if you make someone a prime on a house that they're not in, on good terms with, that's going to affect your relationship with them. So that's kind of the level of diplomacy and you don't have nearly as many characters you know this isn't like you know crusader kings there's thousands of characters i mean you might have up to about a hundred is about the most for any game but you really have these kind of interweaving relationships and your decisions do affect other things throughout the game you know we talked earlier about decisions that resonate throughout the game that's another reason why i think it's you know very much a grand strategy game because you know the effects are um consistent and they resonate for a while so so it's not diplomacy in the traditional sense of you're you know negotiating with aliens and things like that. Um, it's more diplomacy in the sense that you're trying to keep your empire held together and you have to make tough choices about uh, where to apply your political capital and, and, and what house you, you basically have to just let go and kind of do their own thing. Mm -hmm. speaking, of, speaking of the houses, now I'd, l I'd like you to... Before, actually, actually, let me correct myself. Before I get into the houses... Since you brought up the primes, I'd like to ask about that. Now, one of the more enduring uh, motifs that I that I have had with um, si with civilization has been the um, advisors. And if you're thinking that I'm using this as a segue to point out how insane it was that you had Elvis as an advisor, the <laughs> answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, but. How similar or different would primes be to, say, advisors in civilization? So right now, not very. But our goal is, in our you know final version, mm -hmm. um, we hope to have them a lot more similar to that. So in your Grand Vizier already kind of plays that role. You can actually send your Grand Vizier to a system that's struggling, and they will give you a report about what they is good, what's bad, and what they would do to fix it. And that's, you know, that's something that's fa a fairly recent addition. Um, and players really like it because it kind of gives them a hint. And you don't have to do this. If you're an expert player, you can kind of figure it out on your own. But if you're new or if, you, you know, you, you're, you don't, you, you're kind of stuck on, wow, I've got the system. It's not making any money. You know, they're, they're terrible at mining. You know, everyone, their people are about to riot. Like, what's going on? You can send your Grand Vizier, just like an emperor would. Hey, you're my most trusted advisor. I need you to go see what's going on. And, you know, system you know, hoof and horn and, 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 you know, tell me what's going on so I can fix it. And so that's basically how, how it works in the game. You get a report, you say, well, you should probably find a new vice uh, system governor. Um, you know, this planet's unhappy because there aren't very many jobs. You need to get the viceroy to, um, you know, increase, you know, the uh, farming sector because you have a lot of farmers here that aren't working and they're unhappy, stuff like that. So, you know, from a, so we want to expand that, you know, your war prime already kind of, you work with that, but we want to expand it to where all the primes, you know, you have a domestic prime, economic prime, science prime, and um, Intel prime. And so you would be able to interact with them. They would give you various issues that, that kind of correspond under their Aegis and give you the option to, you know, investigate them further or give you advice. So that's kind of a, a long range goal. Um, you know, we just feel like, again, it contributes to that top level. You're managing through your people. 
and you're managing at a top level, it makes sense that you would manage through your through your top advisors who are your primes. All right. Now, when it comes to the when it comes to the great houses, um, two thing two things I wanted two things I wanted to go over. One is just the just where the idea of doing the great houses in this particular style kind of came from and just and just a bit of the skinny on on um, what on what a what a play style that fa that favors each of them um might look like well um houses i've always been intrigued by the idea of houses um you know i played a lot of battle tech mm -hmm. and you know that whole universe even though it's very inconsistent of late, you know, I, I, I like it. And I like the idea of these, you know, large houses that control, you know, the hundreds of, of systems and, you know, it, it just, I don't know. It, I've always been fascinated by these gigantic far future, you know, entities and that they're basically kingdoms within their right. Mm -hmm. um, but they don't call them king, you know, they're, they're houses because they have, but they are kingdoms in, in, in pretty much all form. Yeah. So, when we were kind of sketching out ideas, so when we were thinking remaking, you know, what was Imperium, the original Imperium did not have houses. So you were basically a unified uh, empire. And then, you know, kind of thinking about, well, what, you know, what differentiates, you know, we think of, start thinking about cultures and about, you know, is this empire homogenous or, you know, is it fractured? And then what would the fracture lines be? Because you can't just do it by, you know, you know, you have, you have to have something that, basically are the threads of an empire that need to pull apart because your goal, you know, if you're trying to rebuild the empire, you need something to tug on. And those threads basically became the great houses because you can't, you know, you can, you can manipulate great houses. They have a house leader and now you have sort of a, an entity. You have a bad guy. You know, if you have a house that's very hostile to you and is very powerful, now you have something that you can fight or something that you can scheme against. It's not just like a nameless, Oh, there's planets or systems out in the, you know, serious sector that are revolting, you know, that's not as interesting as, you know, House Waldegrave is about to go to war and they have a huge army and, and, and Navy. And if I don't suck up to their house leader, they're probably going to attack me in the next 10 turns. You know, now you, it just makes it more real, I guess, to a player when you can kind of interact with, and, then, and you kind of build the stories because house leaders can die. They have successors the successors come online, perfectly reasonable strategy to, you know, basically have an old house leader that you know is probably going to die soon anyway and suck up the successor that's a lot younger. And then when they come online um, and take over the house, suddenly you have a much better relationship. So, you know, that it kind of goes into telling stories. You know, we talk from the beginning, we talk about, you know, the emperor of the game is about stories. It's about your story as an emperor. So the houses kind of have a big part of that. Um, as far as different gameplay types, I mean, there are, you know, you you have kind of an open slate to rebuild the empire. Um, you know, we, I don't know, you know, when you play the game and I grant we've added tutorial and we've added more tool tips and, and that's something we're really going to expand. But, you know, when you start the game, if you just start a, a open campaign and you start it up, you're kind of like, wow, okay, what do I do? Because the game doesn't necessarily hold your hand. You know, you can, you know, your goal at the end of the day is one of two things. There are two win conditions currently. You either you know, research what's called the Lazarus Project and basically ascend into transcendence, or you become a tyrant and basically dissolve the Celestial Council by being overwhelmingly powerful and um, uniting the Empire basically as a dictatorship or as a, uh, a, a tyran tyrannocracy. Um, so, but how you get there is entirely up to you. You know, if you want to, you can... Subjugate houses. You can have them vassalized. Become, become they're such good friends. They basically agree to be part of the empire and and you know give away their their holdings and things like that. I mean, you can woo them diplomatically. You can give them um, money. You can give them materials. You know, you can threaten them. You have you have what are called inquisitors, which are like your kind of like your special forces or your intel forces that can um, you know take on missions, assassinate house leaders, and you know, um, topple, topple houses and the and structure and things like that. So, you know, you have a lot of different levers as the emperor to sort of take on these houses, but there's no right or wrong way to do it. You can do it, you know, economically. I mean, you can even do it by cutting them off. There's a logistical network that connects the empire. You can just simply cut off 
and cut them off from the empire, that means they can't trade anymore. That means they can't send military forces. Um, pops can't, um, they can't relocate to other systems. You know, there's migration in the game and you know, you basically cut them off and they'll be furious and their friends will be, their houses, friends will be furious and your fear will go up. But you know what? It, it's, it's going to slowly, if you do it, you'll slowly choke them off. And so you have to put up with the unrest and the idea that your ruling is a tyrant. Your fear level will skyrocket, but that's an option available to you. You can, you know, you can exile people from the empire. If you, you know, we talked about earlier, if there's a, a planet that is just not being run the way you want and the house doesn't agree to change the administrator to someone you want, you can have that person exiled. Um, you can have them assassinated you know, through your inquisitors. Again, there's risks to that, there, but there's not a right or wrong way. Um, the game gives you a ton of avenues to accomplish things, and it's up to you, essentially, as the emperor, to manage the consequences. All right, that makes, that makes sense. Um, no, I, I will admit, looking at, looking at each, each of them, when it comes, what were... Was there any was there any sort of um, like it, I guess for lack of a better term desi design bible that you had when it came to designing the individual houses as in as in did you have as in um... yes yes we do have a design bible mm -hmm. in fact uh, one of the people working on the project uh, Oliver he's kind of our resident um, writer uh, I do a lot of the writing but you know he kind of helps part time and he's been involved with the game for several years now. He just started as a fan, you know, and it was just like eventually got to the point where he had so many good ideas. I'm like, you know what? You should we should probably implement some of this stuff and bring you on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, but we do actually have a great house Bible. Uh, we have a culture Bible. And I mean, you know, it's actually fairly detailed. You know, we want the great houses to feel, you know, the, they'll have their own insignia. Like, not, you know, the insignia is kind of a placeholder right now, but we're in the process of making new like banners and new um, crests for them. So that you know, you know, like Waldegrave is part of what's called the Spartan culture, which is very warlike. And so, and we're going to have actual bespoke house leaders so that right now they're all generated with the, with the universe, but you'll have, you know, when you go, Waldegrave is in the game and not all, and not all great houses are in the game. So there's 12 great houses currently. We're going to have 20 when the game ships mm -hmm. and there'll only be five of those 20 will actually be in the game at any one time. So you don't never know who you're going to play against. But, you know, when you get Waldegrave, you're like, oh, boy, you know, because they're naturally hostile. They're naturally, you know, it's, in that sense, it's kind of like playing, you know, um, I don't know, like any 4X game where you have like the, you know, the, I guess, galactic civilizations, you know, where you're, you're playing the uh, Dringan. You know, it's always going to be a struggle. They're always going to be attacking. They're always going to be hard to, to, to be diplomatic with. So that and that is kind of what we want players to feel. Is like, oh boy, it's Waldegrave, or oh good, it's Kirli Finn. Great, they have great. Their thing is science and energy. So if I need a lot of and, and energy is really critical in the game, they're like, great, I have someone that can generate a lot of energy. I just need to make sure I'm on good terms with them, and, and that they'll trade with me. So, um, so yeah, I mean, we put a lot of thought into the the the, the history. Um, we have a thousand year because um, the game spans back a thousand years, um, back basically like 1960s all the way to third three three thousand fifty. And there's a huge timeline that kind of um, talks about how the houses came to be. And there's, um, you know, there was a Terran Federation in the 2500s. And that's when the alien Zill attacked the second time and kind of scattered the empire at that point. And that's when the houses grew. And so, I mean, we put a lot of thought into kind of the backstory. A lot of that isn't visible, mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of, we, we intend on making that more visible in the final game. And, and, you know, where players that are interested in the backstory and in the houses and things like that can access that information. Yeah. And given give when it came to when it came to the writing of the of the houses and the people who lead them, was it a case where those were where those were right those were written complementary to each other or what or was it a case where you were writing characters and and um, assi and assigning it separately? Well, the characters we we started with the great houses first. The characters themselves are very well, um, we just re very, very recently um, started creating the house leader um, bios because right now, again, that's going to be a future version where you'll have the bespoke leaders. But the houses, no, they, they were definitely meant to be um, because we have six different cultures and the cultures are very different. You know, we have um, Spartic, we have Neo-American, Mercantile, um, um, 
uh, what do you call it? <laughs> Gilded Worlds. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have uh, uh, natural. Oh, gosh, it's. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the last one. Um, traditionalist. And so they have different strengths and weaknesses. And so in the game is kind of balanced to where you'll have one of each of the cultures. You, you'll pick a culture when you design your own house. And then you'll have uh, at least one of the other. Each of the five houses will have a different culture. So they're all kind of balanced against each other. And you will, um, you will basically have that balance. Like you'll have a warlike house. You'll have a house that's good at farming, which is traditionalist. You know, American are kind of the balance. They're like the humans of the game, essentially. Um, Gilded Worlds are kind of a kind of a weird uh, culture, but they're basically focused on entertainment and self self. Um, I don't want to say self pleasure, sound, but basically like the finer things in life. Um, and so they're they're good at like morale and government. Um, and then you have the uh, Technics that are good at science, and then the Spartics that are good at war. So you have kind of all that balance, and so they do kind of play off against each other and they create some interesting tension because um, cultures have inherent tensions between each other. Like um, Technics and Spartics don't like each other. You know, traditionalists and Gilded Worlds don't like each other just because their cultures are so different. And so that actually has consequences when you have those cultures on a, on a given planet. You can actually have unrest um, if you have uh, two cultures that are too combustible and you have some techs that can kind of help that. And then the Viceroy... There's some, um, um, there, they have some traits that can help with that as well. Um, but yeah, for the most part, I, I feel like the houses are balanced. The cultures are balanced and the, the houses spring from the cultures. Oh, all right. I, and I can, and that's definitely something I can see. Now, when it comes to the action point system, um, is it a case, is it a case where you have a set, where you have a set number of actions each t that you can do that you can do each turn, or or is it get, is it going to be a case where you're choosing what to focus on each turn? How is how is that action point system going to work? So you have a certain amount of action points, and there there's a base number that you always have, and then you have an amount that's based on your mental health, which is called spirit. Mm -hmm. So essentially, the, the 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 happier you are, the more you can do. And if you're super depressed and suicidal, you're not going to get much done. Uh, and then you have your health. So if you're in great health, you can do more. If you're on your deathbed, then obviously you're not going to be very productive. So those three elements kind of combine, and you have an action point. So they'll range anywhere from two to ten. Uh, you also slowly gain them as you get older and more experienced with with running government. Mm -hmm. So most things cost one action point. Um, things like projects, which are really big things that you do in the empire, cost two. Um, you know, a war plan and executing a war plan costs two. Um, but most things you do, including, you know, communicating with c characters, talking to viceroys, you know, talking to anyone, the Celestial Council, passing laws, um, researching, um, you know, basically anything that you do that changes the, you know, that's a decision in the game costs uh, an action point. So you'll find that our goal, our hope is that you always have to make trade-offs between what you want to do and what you need to do. So for the most part, I mean, you know, what it always it drives me nuts when I play 4X games where you're just clicking next turn, next turn, next turn. You're just trying to get that whatever built. You know, you know, you've got something, a big project that's got 11 turns to go, and you're just click, 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 waiting for it. And that's 11 turns that to me is just you could be doing things, you, you know. And, and, and so a big part of our design was to really make every turn meaningful. There's not as many turns in this game as there are, I guess, on a typical 4X mm -hmm. um, because you have a finite lifespan. <clears throat> That's something you're kind of competing against. So every turn should feel meaningful. And those action points, you know, you should be like, man, I, oh, I've only got two action points left. I got all the stuff I need to do. You know, wh wh you know, where do I put my time? So that's a big pivot of the game. Yeah. Now... Of course, no 4X game would be complete without some without some sort of um, tech tree. And I know that you're not doing microman micromanagement as much as other 4X games, but does that does that minimizing of micromanagement also apply to tech trees or some or some equivalent, or is that something that's not being focused on? So um, science is actually a little unique. Yes, there is a tech tree. 
Um, however, and again, you have to remember, you're the emperor. You're not down there in the labs talking to the scientists. You know, so basically you have two areas of focus. You have social technologies and you have military technologies. And your only job as emperor is to determine what the split of your science point, which is the, you know, you generate a certain amount of science points throughout your empire and they're generated from your houses. And a neat thing is, again, we talk about relationships. So if a house hates you or you have a poor relationship, they're not going to give you their science points, even if they have a ton of labs. Whereas if a house really likes you, you have a great relationship or you're vassalized, then they'll give you up to 100% of their science points. So um, plus, of course, the ones you own, you know, your holdings directly. So the science points get basically you, you can determine the split between the military and the social. And then you decide what fields each each, you know, military has six fields. Social has six fields and the fields are where the texts actually lie. And so you might say, I want to focus on um, economic texts or what's called prosperity. They're not, but you know, the, the field is called prosperity. Mm -hmm. And so you have five levels in each field and you just say, I want to focus on prosperity. So you can't say, I want to focus on expanded trade hubs. Every year, your scientists will check to see what um, tech is available. Basically, it's like a breakthrough. And if it's something that's available for them to research, and then it may it may be research. So you know you're putting the science points into prosperity, and once you get enough points to to get a breakthrough, then they'll say, "Aha, we've discovered one of these three available technologies." It's maybe a little bit like the old Master of Orion, the original one, where you mm -hmm. or the Master of Orion two, where you basically got one of three choices, but you didn't make the choice. It's like, okay, there's three in this class, and you get one of them. Yeah. Um, it's not quite that restrictive because you can go back and continue to research in that field until you get the one you want. Um, and then once you uh, uh, research at least half of the fields in any given level, you can move up a level. But if you move up a level, you can never go back. So you just want to make sure you've gotten the, um, you know, the text, the research that you want out of that level before you move forward. So as an emperor, your only role in that is obviously from a grand strategy, make sure you have a ton of labs, make sure you got a lot of science points coming in, but then just determining the split and determining what fields you want to focus on. Um, so, you know, and that's what we feel like an emperor would, would do, you know, make sure we have a strong science apparatus throughout our empire. You know, I really want to focus on military. You know, we know we're going to war. Let's really shun our, our research into military applications. And I really want to focus on warships as a, as a, um, focus. And I really want to focus on, uh, ground weapons or uh, ground assault, which is also a, 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 um, a field of research. So, because I know I'm going to be going to war, I need to build bigger ships and I'm going to be conquering planets soon. So that's the scope at which we feel like an emperor would be thinking and not thinking, okay, we need individual guns. We need to, we need to focus on like an advanced assault rifle and we need better transports and they need to have better armor. You know, that's, that's not the scale that emperors should be thinking on in our view. Mm -hmm. And I'm get I'm, I'm guessing that I'm guessing that within that um within the within the tree within the trees you're pro you're probably not going to fall into the same pitfalls that other 4x games have had where in order to get a certain thing you've got to you've got to go through branches that don't seem to connect. No, there's a few branches. Um, and the Lazarus Project has some. There's some cross branches, um, but. They make sense for, you know, the Lazarus Project is basically like a supercomputer that's been, you know, found. And that's kind of how you kick it off. That was dormant during the Terran Federation era. And then you've, you've basically uncovered the technology that, that lets you build this transcendence engine. But you've got artificial life and you've got like nano computing. And, and I mean, it's the text that makes sense for, OK, I'm trying to build this supercomputer. So these are what I need. And the game tells you what you need. You can get every technology that's not like you'll ever be locked out. The only way you'd be locked out of a technology, because you can also kill a project. You know, when you discover a, 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 a field of research, you'll get a pop-up saying, you know, your majesty, we've discovered, you know, um, advanced trade hubs. And you can be like, great, let's research that. That sounds, or no, I don't need that at all. Kill the project. What that does, it kills a project. You can never research it again, but it will immediately um, basically add some points to your, uh, to that field and then give you a chance to roll a different tech. So, but remember, you have to get at least half the text. And if you kill too many texts, you can never move forward. So, um, so it's kind of a balance between, you know, you're not locking you out of any particular tech, but just like real science, 
you can put money into a field that doesn't mean you're going to always find exactly what you're looking for. A lot of it is kind of meant to model, you know, inspiration and some randomness in, in, in these, you know, grand science projects. You don't know what you're going to get out of it always. So, uh, but no, every, every, every uh, tech is available. There's no um, crazy cross techs or anything like that. That would, that would be too hard to follow. Would it be fair to say that you're aiming for randomness, but not necessarily aiming for pray to RN Jesus? Yes, I hate. Well, yeah, and, and that's a great way of putting it. Uh, RN Jesus, I like that. Um, I I hate games to where it feels like you win or lose with a die roll, and you know. And I play a lot of solitaire board games. It's kind of a hobby of mine, and honestly, a lot of them kind of end that way. You know, you kind of you spend all this time, all this hours. And then you have this one final decision or this one final level or one final battle or whatever, and it ends up being a die roll. And that determines whether you win or lose. I mean, and sometimes that's that's a great example of a really balanced game where it came down to that. But if the whole game was designed to where you're kind of, you know, like let's say you're um, building up kind of a uh, chances to where you know you have this one final die roll at the end of the game and your whole game is spent about basically improving your odds – but at the end of the day, you're still rolling a die. To me, that's not a lot of fun. So, you know, you should have choices and deal with when things don't always go your way. But I don't ever like the idea of one die roll just always determining, you know, whether or not the game is, is winnable or whether you're in an impossible position. So, mm -hmm. you know, we'd like to think that the design always gives you a way to kind of back out. Okay, well, I didn't get the technology I wanted. Well, I can either keep hammering and keep throwing money at it. and Eventually, I'll get there. Or like, you know what? I don't need it that bad. Let's just do a UE three-point turn and go find another field that might be better for us. But you're not forced to make that choice. And the game doesn't lock you out um, just because of one quote-unquote bad die roll. And then you can just put a lot more money into that or a lot more science points into that category or turn off all the other fields that you're focusing on one category and then it gets a lot more science points. So you have a lot more chances. So there's, there's yes, there's some randomness, but no, it's not out of your hands. Which I, I appreciate because um, something I'm trying to get written out on a t-shirt th that basically says, Jesus saves, RN Jesus doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I... If, if you need to know, as far as why I have a burning hatred for RN Jesus, I played the Long War mod. That's why. Okay, yeah, I love the, I love the Long War mod. I love it, but at the same at the same time, it drove me insane. Jeez. And you've and you you've probably dealt with um, with the with with the lies of XCOM's odds to hit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it seems like they never actually. I mean, you can have a ninety percent hit, and it's like you miss three times in a row. Like what? How does that even how does that even happen? So there's something else going on in the background. That's yeah. that's always frustrated me. Fifty percent of the time it works none of the time. Right. Yeah. That and now one thing, you know, Phoenix Point is a game that, you know, Julian Gallup, he's the original XCOM guy, yeah. you know, they make a point of saying, you know, the, the the stats you see, the odds you see, they're the real stat they're the real odds. And I think it's funny that they have to make that a prominent point of their, you know, game selling to say no really we're giving you the right odds that you see on the screen but it's i true. think it i think it's because of the fact that the the xcom odds thing has has gotten so out of hand that it's become a meme over the years yeah well and it's kind of like if you play the xcom you know the firaxis xcom course that you know this is what you're going to put up with and i mean obviously it's a great game i mean I, I think overall it's a brilliant game but that is an annoying part of it and and, you know, I don't like scum saving. I think it's kind of cheating. But sometimes it's like, really? Really? I got it behind an alien. I have a 92% chance. My best, you know, soldier did a headshot. And I missed. And now they, they you know, reattacked me and killed me. Like, come on. That's, you I know, that's do, not. Under normal circumstances, I don't do X. I don't do um, save scumming. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to give me bullshit. Don't act surprised when you get bullshit back. Pretty much, pretty much. So yeah, they can't they, they can't complain when when people do that if that's the way they're going to set up that mechanic. I agree. Yeah, and besides, I've um, I would say I would save scum the shit out of um out of Kaizo World when I'd play that because the game's so hard you have to. Oh, 
but now taking taking that into taking that into account now given the fact that you that you're doing the whole notion of every um for lack of a better term run is different I'm curious if it's going to be a case where a lot of where a lot of that is fully randomly generated or if there's the option to tweak the um parameters before before you start the way the way you can tweak the parameters um in a lot of other 4x games so eventually yes that's not currently really an option i mean you can set up your own house and you can uh you'll be able to set the size of the m of the galaxy and a few other things but yeah we'll have a mode where you can choose the houses that you play against you can choose the cultures you can choose the relative level of prosperity in the galaxy mm -hmm. um you can turn on or off the uh the Zill sort of, uh, you know, end game. Um, that's basically planned for 1.0. Uh, it won't be an early release, but it, or the the early access, but that is a plan for the final release. All right, and I, I can definitely get that, and I'll be I'll be looking forward to it. Um, but with that, with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity, and. Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Huh. Well, I appreciate you having me, Mildra. Um, I love talking about the game. Uh, I love talking about just the genre in general. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I've, I've enjoyed my time. Yeah. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the Internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>